you can't get to the level of fighting a fire, running an alarm call, if you haven't put enough resources in for the actual action happening. Doing something that's not urgent. There needs to be more time spent there than actual running the emergency. The reality, the emergency is only emergency for so long. If you operate there too long, you get burned out. If you don't utilize that time between the alarms effectively, then you won't have the, the actual internal resources to run at a maximum efficiency. Welcome to the Business Builder Way podcast, where we help business builders grow leadership skills and wisdom and stay grounded through hero stories. So let's get after it. Hey, business builders. Today, we are joined by Jared Buckley. Jared is the fire chief coach, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get rolling. But here on season two, what we've been working on is interviewing our members of the builder groups, our business builders who meet weekly and who also gather up live at events and talking about their businesses and lives and what they're creating. And Jared, it's uh, really good to have you here with us today. Awesome. Thank you, Wayne. Glad to be here. For sure. So on some of these, I've been asking people, who are you and why are you here? But I'm going to ask you, where are you? Because for those who are not watching a video you have some interesting things in the background it looks like a mask with a hose and i see firefighters (laughs) of course i know where you're at but earlier you picked it up and actually showed us the room where are you and kind of show us well this room is called the fish tank but it's a glass room but this is just a bunch of decorations in a fire department i'm at uh, their headquarters and this is up in washington but i don't live in washington and i live in arizona and i have a, a couple contracts up here travel two times a month and do coaching with chiefs from these two different departments and a couple of one-off things with other surrounding departments in this area. Gotcha. So the fire chief coach, the work that you're doing, you are a coach, you're helping people to build leadership skills, live more intentionally. And I know you're also helping firefighters who are like perpetually on and helping them to sort out life even in between the calls or alarms that they have. Right. But tell us what is your business? What is this fire chief coach? So I started into the coaching arena a few years ago and I primarily was in just the business sector and I got into it and I was doing coaching and consulting and training with the millennial generation. So how to manage millennials. And that's how I got my feet wet. So as I went into that arena, slowly but surely, I started doing more around the idea of emotional intelligence and the emotional intelligence and leadership and and everything like that. Well, executives started asking me, hey, do you just coach millennials or do you coach, you know, us? What's the difference? Honestly, that was how I approached it. What's the difference? You're a human being, of course. Like, I don't see the difference. So I started coaching more executive level stuff. Got in contact with the fire department up here in Washington. They brought me in to do coaching with a a millennial. Did that for a few months. And then they asked, hey, do you coach fire chiefs? What are these questions? Like, do I coach executives or fire chiefs? I'm like, yeah, it's, Mm -hmm. it's a person, right? They are a person, but they're unique individuals. And I started coaching these fire chiefs and primarily what I was doing was approaching leadership and emotional intelligence in leadership. I slowly learned a lot of behavior sets that were coming out of these fire chiefs and how they developed these behavior sets over the years of being firefighters. I mean, the fire chiefs were firefighters at one point and they rose up the ranks and started escalating everything that they're doing, getting promoted into their level of incompetence, right? And they constantly butted their heads against things that they just couldn't do. They weren't trained for. What they didn't realize, it wasn't just competencies. There were skill sets or behavior sets or even mindsets. And so I started coaching these chiefs and I realized I was doing a lot of behavior change in my coaching, a lot of mindset shift. So Uh, One of the certifications I've got was NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And so that works with the unconscious mind. And as I was working with the unconscious mind with these fire chiefs, having to change stories for these guys. Like, 
they're not running a fire call when they're in the office. So sure. I started asking questions like, hey, what's your call? Now that you shifted in this, what's your call? So I started coaching really specifically to the fire chief and learning that there is a prototype. Now they're not all the same, but there is a prototype of what a fire chief looks like and what they actually need coaching in on a leadership level. So that's how I dove into this and, and really coaching on emotional intelligence leadership with fire chiefs. Talk a little bit more about what is emotional intelligence and how do you help somebody, I, I guess you would say, develop emotional intelligence or grow their emotional intelligence? Okay, so I'll teach it just like I teach, I teach a fire chief. Emotional intelligence, most everybody to some degree can understand just by the, the terminology, right? But emotional intelligence is simply this. It's your response level to your actions, okay? So if, from a fire standpoint, a incident happens, the incident gets to the dispatch, dispatch goes to send the alarm, and when the alarm goes, resources are sent. That's fire terms in its basic form. Emotional intelligence is no different. An intangible incident happens into our brain. We start telling the story. We start telling what our perception is of the story. The dispatcher doesn't know what's actually happening. It's just perception. So the perception happens. It sends the alarm. The alarms are the hormones that get sent into our system, the emotions that get sent into our system to resource or send the resources, the behaviors to what our emotions are doing. That's emotional intelligence in its simplest form. Got it. And from a fireside <laughs> standpoint. Yeah. And so you help people see that and kind of harness that. That makes sense to me. And I, so we, we, you are a business builder, you're a coach, and then you're building a business around coaching. You have a business around coaching, but you're working to take that work that you've been doing one-on-one -on -one to even more people. And, and you're in our group and you're around other people that have let's say like more traditional businesses, doctors, offices, remodeling companies, construction, funeral home in your group. And as business owners, business builders, we often find, I think that we're putting out fires all the time. So it's helpful to have this perspective from you and other people listening can think like, well, if we're honest, we do often live in that zone of, firefighting and sometimes we make fires and sometimes we avoid doing proactive things to prevent fires and it's kind of crazy sometimes i think the behavior patterns that we can be in yeah in fact you and i sent back a message about a little video of important urgent i've used that illustration a couple times in my coaching sessions the fire industry lives and operates in important and urgent in fact, to such a high level that they don't even see that the others exist. In fact, if it's not important, it's not urgent. If it's not urgent, it's not important. Like mm. they block out just two quadrant, not urgent, not important, or important and urgent. And it is dangerous. Some of them, not all, some of them know it, but they also don't know how to approach it either. They see that the important non-urgent is important. We need to invest in time. That's fire prevention. Fire suppression is the important, the urgent. That's what they've been trained in. This is where it's not much different from an executive. The important and urgent is the sexy. Let's be honest. We don't get it as business owners because we think things are dull. We wouldn't be there. So as a business owner, you're looking for the sexy, man. Let's go after them. Let's put out fire. You started a business to put out a fire. It was a problem. You went to solve a problem. You're just carrying a different hose line. That's all you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so looking at it from that standpoint, okay, back off the sexy dude. Go find what actually prevents the real problems. Get out ahead of it. Because if you're relying on just your reactionary leadership, sales, fill in the blank, the thing's going to overcome you at some point. You're going to have some spot fire that cuts right behind you and you're done. You're engulfed, man. So personally, 
I have things that are urgent and important right now in my work life, which is okay. Uh, okay. Well, and, and maybe it's not even like urgent, but well, kind of like I have to be there. I have to do it. This podcast interview that uh, interview that you and I are recording right now is in my calendar. It's a commitment. I'm going to show up and do it. I have a bunch of coaching clients. We have time scheduled. I'm going to show up and do it at the same time. I'm working to build my business and I'm working on my ops manual for our business builder group to try to have a consistent way that we onboard new people, the way that we introduce them to their groups, things like that, which is more of that proactive. It's not urgent, but it's really important, but you're right. It's not very sexy. It's not very hot and burning at the moment. And then what I was going to say to you is, and ask you how you interpret this on Monday night, I went to yoga and I scheduled it for 7.15 at night because I had a bunch of classes I had bought as a package. And, you know, I started to think I was too busy and I almost canceled it. I almost didn't go, but I went, I did go. And it was this kind of like relaxing type yoga where at the end you end up taking 10 minutes to just slack out. And I felt so good afterwards. Everything was so calm, but there's still all this like workload there that didn't go anywhere the next day's calendar, but I, I just hadn't felt that relaxed in a while. Of course, I've got kids like you do and everything and a lot going on. Is that important to do things like that? More so than we want to admit. You can't get to the level of fighting a fire, running an alarm or running a call if you haven't put enough resources in before the actual action happens. So the whole idea of pulling away and doing something that's important, not urgent, right? Uh, whether it be shoot mental health, whether it be personal, family, spouse, whether it be taking your team out and doing a leadership retreat, there needs to be more time spent there than actual running the emergency. The reality, the emergency is only emergency for so long. And if you operate there too long, you get burned out. Your body is not meant to operate at that level for a long period of time. The fire service does an excellent job in maximizing stress-induced hormones. They operate off of stress, but they also go back to the station. And if you don't utilize that time between the alarms effectively, then you won't have the resources to run, the, the actual internal resources to run at a maximum efficiency. So going to yoga, taking your wife, going on a trip. I mean, as you said, Wayne, like I have five kids. That takes some time. Do I need to sit there on the phone and listen to my wife talk about our crazy kids and how she's ready to quit? You know, quit being a mom. And yeah, I need to listen to that. Why? Because that's part of the important non-urgent stuff. My, my marriage will go to waste if I don't spend that time there. And when will I see the, the ROI there? I don't know. That's the problem. We don't know when that return on investment happens, but the small things matter. Right. Don't sweep them under the carpet because you don't know when the, the ROI is going to pop up. Yeah. Other than, you know, up until the day, I don't think I've ever really thought so much about how business builders, business owners are very much like your fire chiefs and this whole like getting the resources, having the resources when there's an emergency. It's, it's really good. You have me thinking, but I want to keep going on your stuff. So part of your mission is to help these fire chiefs between the alarms, right? Your program that you're building uses that language. So can you share a little bit about what is it that you're building? What is leadership between the alarms? You're, I think you're planning to do a, a leadership intensive gathering. Mm -hmm. What are you building towards? Yeah. So I was challenged by one of the chiefs because what I was doing was one-on-one -on -one coaching with chief officers. And they asked me, hi, okay, how do you take what you're doing and bring it down the line? to company officers, battalion chiefs, like take exactly what you're doing and just distribute to more. Well, okay. That was like three years ago. I'm like, dude, I don't know how to do that. So over the last two to three years, and specifically about a year ago when 
I was out with business builders and challenged by a bunch of business owners. How do I do this? Well, the whole concept for me is leadership between the arms. What happens between these calls to effectively get you to run the calls correctly? So whatever that call is, right? So as I'm focusing on this and emotional intelligence, mental health, uh, behavior change, relationships at home, your, your spouse, all that stuff, it matters. That's what marks the leadership. It resources there. So doing leadership between the arms, well, got challenged by some of the business builder guys and they said, Hey, can you break this out? Well, I thought, yeah, I can. And so the concept came out as five alarm leadership and it's progressional leadership, intentional, strategic, mm -hmm. progressional leadership. First alarm is what every call needs. And that's personal leadership. Every response needs personal leadership to that response. I don't care what response it is. I don't care what incident it is. It needs personal leadership. Yep. The second one is relational leadership. That's one-on-one -on -one relational, not three, not two. It's one-on-one. -on -one. So how do I do the one-on-one -on -one correctly? Next one, communal leadership, teams, crews, shifts. Fourth, tribal leadership, big organizations. Last one, transformational leadership. And so what I'm building right now and attempting to build is a coaching system in the fire service specifically designed to fire chiefs down to company officers to build their leadership while we could do a training and not going to do that. I'm doing a coaching experience. Like this is designed to be coaching. And what I'm hoping to do and planning to do is build a system that as guys get to a level, guys, gals get to a level of third alarm leadership, that communal leadership, there's a feedback loop. They come right back into the personal leadership and start leading the others the same way. Okay. So I'm trying to develop the system and it's not going to be a one-year process, two-year process. It's a long process. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm building right now is the five alarm leadership, really the leadership between the arms. And, and so ultimately your goal is to impact more of these chiefs and officers that are in these fire companies why does this light you up how will this make the world a better place oh good you're smiling yeah i know what resources i've been given i know what i've been provided in my life i know what exercises i've gone through that has put me in this position there is a unique alignment to me and firefighters and fire chiefs the the fire service i connect really well with them but there's also a big gaping hole in the fire service that has a relation to leadership, has a relation to mental health. These people have walked into the fire service understanding that they are walking into a sack of career. They understand that they're in the business of loss mitigation. That loss mitigation has transformed not just to fire prevention and, and property and people, but it's their own loss mit mitigation. It's their own life. And so a lot of these firefighters are sacrificing themselves for the benefit or for something else. And they've blocked up their lives. They, they've ruined their family. They've ruined their marriage. They've ruined their health. And all for serving, serving, right? Someone needs to serve them. Someone needs to provide for them. And if for some way, somehow, I can do a little something for my brother, who's a fire captain, then somebody else's brother is going to get served. Because I tell you right now, a bunch of these individuals are completely blocked off and will not let you in. And I'm walking into a fire service that they don't let you in. It's a fraternity. You better have credentials. You better have a backing. You better have a referral to all this. I'm trying to do something very much impossible because I was never in the fire service. And so that's my call. That's literally, that's why I'm doing this. So I'm going to transition as we're kind of getting towards the end of, of our time together, transition into you have experience being fire chief in a sense though. Like I get it that you're not, you were an EMT, but you weren't in the fire service. 
your family in the fire service and your wife's family ranch almost burned down and there were fire people there. <laughs> I remember, but you and your wife, staff and your children, you've had it in, this is, could be the subject of a whole nother podcast, right? But you've had some health challenges and you've been in super stressful situations where you got a major call and had to resource it. As you say, you've been touched by some pretty traumatic experiences and gotten through to the other side that really has prepared you in a lot of ways to serve other people here. Hasn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Without a doubt. That is part of the, the experience and the resources I've been provided. So our oldest daughter was born with down syndrome and before she was born, they, they told us that she would have 60% chance to survive. And they said she had a heart defect, heart abnormality, And we went through the pregnancy and then she was born. And then three months after that, she had open heart surgery and they had to fix. Basically, she was missing the entire wall in her, in the middle of her heart. So she didn't have a a full left side and right side. And so the the blood was just mixing. And so that's, she would turn blue. She'd go into congestive heart failure. It's not always fun seeing a two month old just turn blue and go into congestive heart failure. And throughout the whole process, my wife and I went through, people started asking us questions, saying, how, how in the world do you get through this? And one, obviously, it was our faith. Our daughter's name is Faith, but it is it was through our faith. And, you know, Jesus was our foundation to all of this. But what I had to do as I kept on getting this question was, okay, how do I walk this backwards and figure out what I did and what we did? And so for the next five years, I I took the time to look at how we did this. And it really came down to two words. And the two words that I use is called flip it. We learned how to flip the story that we were running in our head. And when we go into the incident response and it goes into dispatch, we work the dispatch alarm system. The dispatch was the perception. It was the story that we're telling ourselves of what we think has just happened. Well, here's the thing. There's only one person that controls the dispatch, and that's me. If I can work to control the story that I have, then I control the alarm being sent and the resources that we have. So I broke it down to, hey, what is a flip? What is it flip? There's three stories that conduce the most stress. I don't have. If I'm running a story that says I don't have, I don't have the resources, I don't have the relationships, I don't have the possessions, the money, whatever. If I don't have, heavy stress induced. The second one is I cannot. Now we're talking about competencies. I'm not able to. I can't Mm -hmm. run a mile. I can't run a marathon. I can't go across the store. I can't, I can't, I can't. We run that story. It starts inducing stress. The last and most powerful one. And the one that people run into, as soon as I hear their story coming to me and they start talking, I have to go after this one. If it goes here, this is a really big issue. I am not. If I'm running the story that I am not, that is the core value. That's a belief system of who I am as a person. And it will affect that I can't do, that I don't have. So I got to go after that I'm not. And how do you do this? You change your story. I am. Flip it. Flip. I am what? Because anything your brain hears as I'm not, it's going to send that stress. It's going to boom, boom, boom. And you're going to shut off. You're going to go, I'm threatened in this position. I'm going to go in survival mode. I back out. I isolate. I do whatever. So right. change the story that I am. I'm a great father. I'm a powerful individual. I'm able to overcome all scenarios. I am, I am, I am. The most ideal way to do this is change your, or flip your I am in the actual thing that It's I'm not. So if I'm not a good father, find where you are a good father. If you still can't do that and you're like, dude, I'm too stuck on that. Find something else. Do anything else. I'm something else. Your brain needs a positive reinforcement. So 
hijack the system and find that I am somewhere else. Your brain just needs that right hormone being sent into your whole system. So you flip your story. I am, I can, and I do have. So that's a little bit of the story of our daughter and what she taught us. Not to mention she had two more open heart surgeries in two right. years down the road and down the road. And then we had another kid that had open heart surgery too, but that's, you know, whatever. After you have one kid with open heart surgery, you just have to, whatever, <laughs> not big deal. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so but part of these podcasts is for people that are new to business builders, get to get mm-hmm. to know other members or if they're considering joining to learn who are people in the group. So now you've told us, you know, about a little bit about two kids and surgeries but what's the good stuff what do y'all do on the weekend or weekends when you're not working kids man it's sports right we have five kids there at the ages of 14 10 9 8 5 right okay. so we're in the world of sports and we're sports fanatics and so every day of the week kid you not every day of the week sunday included we have some type of sports going on and that keeps us really busy it challenges us. Uh, we have to over communicate, but also at the same time, we love it. And we find where our greatest uh, resource and give back in that process. It builds our relationship with our kids. Um, it trains them up to be the people we want them to be. And so our job is never done. Yeah. Nice. And the last thing that we're working on in this series is And you alluded to how you had some fire chiefs who were kind of pushing on you to build this business a bit. And then also that you went to last in January of 23, we were in Savannah, Georgia in a group of business owners and they were pushing you and you've been in other mastermind groups too. So like you really have, Mm -hmm. I would say a, a strong right to weigh in, whether it's our business mastermind group or some other mastermind group. What advice would you give to somebody to use this resource that was, I don't know, like one of the first times it was talked about in published books is we were thinking Napoleon Hill and thinking Grow Rich <laughs> talks about the power of the mastermind, right? right? What advice do you have for people to get the most out of a group? I, I mean, anybody that's listening to this, they're probably very aware of you're the the replica of the five people you can spend the most time with. Something to that right. frame, right? Close enough. That, yeah, that's what Jared says. And I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So this is what I say about mastermind. You want to invest into something that's not going to have the urgent result. You want to invest into something that's going to have a long-term effect. Mm. And the mastermind is that. You don't get a return on investment because you spent six months in a mastermind. You get a return on investment because you surround yourself with people that are willing to challenge you willing to hear you and give a different perspective. That's part from my standpoint. I sit and listen a lot in a mastermind. And the reason I listen is I never know what might happen that can produce something down the road. You can't plan for that always. You can't control it always. But you do have to be present. You do have to put yourself in availability to understand that something might happen. And if I'm investing into this over two years, it might be five seconds, but five seconds can change your life. So put yourself in a position that's going to challenge you and and do something different, do it differently. Don't do the same thing you've been doing. Do something different. That's why the mastermind, It's always different because you have different people from different industries with different backgrounds, different beliefs, whatever. Be present. Put yourself available and see what actually might happen. You'll probably be surprised eventually. Might not be right away, but eventually. Keep going. So I love how you, it's very similar to how you started this thing, talking about being more proactive and not always living in the state of putting out fires there's things out there that we can go do that are like, Hey, here's five steps to generate leads on Facebook, for example. And th- that's great. Right. And that's a very active, urgent and important to you and your business right now. You want to learn how to do that. And you want to put a process in place that may be important to somebody. But mm-hmm. what I hear you saying is that mastermind and your experience of that is a little bit more of a, a slow burn. 
<laughs> it's like immersing yourself in, in with these ideas and these people. I also like what I heard within what you were saying is giving as much as you're getting. And you have to have faith that that's what's going to happen over a longer period of time. That if I pour into other people, they're going to pour into me too. Yeah, I mean, it's just the natural flow of things. The the reciprocal element. However much time you invest is how much time you're going to get out. Can't dispute that fact, right? And if I want to provide something for someone, your brain, your mind, it opens you to that. So it's just, it's amazing how the brain works and, and how the mental side works. Like, hey, I'm serving someone. I'm giving to somebody. Not expecting anything on return. So you can't hijack the system. I can't give to to get, but also understanding the simple truth that you do give, something will come back. You just can't sit there waiting. Hey, I gave. Okay, it's like my kids, right? That gave. When do I get back? Like, no, give. And sometimes the give back is just you give too. So, the last question: If that's the case, that mm-hmm. masterminds are something that. you have to be in it and it takes some time and you're building relationships. There's lots, there's lots of peer groups and masterminds out there. What advice would you give to somebody for how to pick the right group for them? That's a good question. You know, I don't have an exact answer to that. And, And maybe that's the answer. There's a lot of feel to this. And I, I, like Wayne, like you said, I've been in a couple of masterminds. And some of them are good. Some of them are okay. At the end of the day, to be honest with you, I really haven't had a bad experience in a mastermind. There's some that I just, it, it fits better. And I think the, the certain people in it, it fit. Sometimes it was the circumstance in the season, like for me personally. But I do remember my wife saying at one point, because when you and I talked about this, I was in the mastermind with you guys and there came a point. I was like, yeah, dude, I might need to step out of this. And my wife was the one that goes, when you look back on all your success and everything you've done in your business, when have you seen the most success? And she points back, she goes, it's been in a mastermind. It's been in a group. Stick through it. Just, just stay in it. It's wise advice. Listen to your wife. Yeah, right. That's probably a good place to end. Jared, thanks for joining us and sharing your story. And we are all cheering for you because we all benefit in our communities. We hope we never need it. But ultimately, somehow us or family members are touched by people who are firefighters, paramedics, so on and so forth. So good work you're doing in the world. And it's a joy to to get to spend time with you every week. So thanks for showing up today, too. Awesome. Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for tuning into the Business Builder Way podcast. If this episode spoke to you, click that subscribe button and share it with a friend. That's how this message gets out into the world. If it is helpful for us to have a short conversation, I'd love to do that. Send me an email at wayne at businessbuildercamp.com.